Um, let me first uh, thank uh, a number of people that uh, uh, allowed me to prepare this, uh, this presentation. Um, there are uh, uh, really large number of astronomers that are, are involved worldwide uh, with uh, producing the science case for extremely large telescopes, several hundred uh, uh, between uh, um, the two sides of the Atlantic alone. Uh, these are the people from whom I stole slides, and uh, they were kind enough to send them to me. So thank you very much. And I also want to, um, to put up a quick disclaimer that uh, predicting the future is uh, uh, something that is uh, not always very uh, accurate. And uh, I have uh, here two nice examples. I like particularly the one of uh, the chairman of the IBM that thought that five computers was the maximum the world uh, would put uh, a requirement for. So what uh, we are seeing now is that uh, uh, a number of uh, astronomical facilities, not only for optical astronomy, but in all areas of, uh, of in all wavelengths uh, and uh, in space and on the ground, are being conceived and put uh, into uh, uh, on the board, bo or the, either the designing board or the construction phase already. Uh, to give us an ensemble, very, very powerful ensemble of uh, instruments and telescopes that uh, um, we want to use uh, to go and probe uh, the history and the, of the universe and uh, the, its components and try to understand it better, um, pr prompted in, in this by the results of the present generation of telescopes. Uh, we have uh, about uh, 12 or, or so, uh, more than a dozen anyway, of uh, 8 to 10 meter telescopes, and they are producing fantastic science and are answering many of the questions that were posed at the time that were conceived. At the same time, they, however, produce uh, a very large number of new questions that uh, are what drive us uh, to think about the next generation of telescopes, uh, the extremely large telescopes. Uh, there are three that are uh, fairly advanced uh, in their uh, detailed design, the Giant Magella Telescope, the 30-meter telescope, and the ELT. And uh, all of them base uh, their technical specification on a number of very exciting science cases uh, that uh, uh, require both uh, uh, collecting area and uh, spatial resolution to be carried out. And uh, uh, these are the science cases that I would like uh, to, to talk to you about this morning. The science case for the is extremely large telescopes uh, bases, is based on essentially three main pillars. One is, uh, of course, uh, the science that uh, uh, we know today we would like to do with uh, those telescopes when they come around. So if you want, uh, uh, it's the science cases that we mostly discuss because the, uh, these are the clever ideas that we have today. Um, but there are other two important pillars. One is uh, the synergies with the other uh, facilities that are going to be present at the same time uh, uh, when the ELTs will start operating. And this is something that we have seen uh, quite a bit of in the recent uh, past and last 10, 20 years. Uh, there have been synergies between uh, space and ground, for example, between the HST and the 8 to 10 meter telescopes which has led to very, very interesting and new discoveries. And this is something that we certainly want uh, to take advantage of. And in fact, the science cases for these telescopes uh, take these uh, as a requirement uh, that uh, all this information can, uh, can be put together from all these uh, different facilities. And of course, the other thing that uh, is important to realize is that uh, uh, many, many of the discoveries of the present and also the past generation of telescopes were things that were certainly not expected or anticipated and were made possible by the fact that the parameter space uh, of discoveries was uh, enlarged by the new generation of instruments, detectors, uh, uh, telescopes, wavelengths, ranges, etc., etc. Uh, this might very well be the most exciting part uh, of what uh, these uh, telescopes uh, will discover, but of course is unfortunately not something we can say very much about, apart to say that uh, uh, the ELT, the, sorry, the extremely large telescopes uh, uh, open par parameter uh, space essentially by their uh, spatial resolution and their photon sensitivity. And uh, they go 
very well beyond what is possible today. Uh, factors uh, that go between uh, 10 and 20 times uh, the collecting power of the present generation of telescope or telescopes in space, uh, of course, uh, have the advantage of not fighting against the atmosphere. I will say something about the synergies as, as I go along, but it's important to realize that uh, uh, there, is an, a, there are a number of uh, uh, facilities that uh, the ELTs uh, will uh, uh, collaborate uh, uh, and cooperate with, starting from ALMA, uh, it's very soon to start its operations, uh, the, the JWST, of course, uh, but also the large survey telescopes, uh, the square kilometer array, and many space missions. The science case that is based on what we today would like to do with a telescope of 30, 20, 40 meters is what we call the, the contemporary science and uh, goes from the direct detection of planets around other stars, including rocky planets, the characterization of their atmosphere, maybe even the search for, for prebiotic molecules, to the understanding of the formation and evolution of galaxies uh, through imaging and spectroscopy of resolved stellar populations uh, in galaxies that are not accessible today, like uh, elliptical galaxies, and the study of black holes and AGNs um, that uh, will allow us uh, to uh, understand better uh, the phenomenon of arctic well -acting nuclei, and to continue to fundamental physics uh, uh, questions uh, like uh, the possible variation of the, of the fundamental constants, uh, direct measurement of the expansion of the universe, and the testing of uh, general relativity around black holes. Um, of course, there are many, many science cases, and uh, being an astronomer, like uh, uh, I like to choose the ones uh, I am most excited about, and so I will not dwell or talk ab about all of these but start uh, with uh, some of them. One important point to realize is that uh, the playground for these telescopes uh, is the whole history of the universe. Uh, we, the, we, the, this telescope will be powerful enough to see the very first objects coming out uh, from the recombination era and uh, up to the present time. And so it's, it's a very, very large uh, do domain of, uh, of discovery space uh, that will be probed. So let me start with the planet science case. Um, the ELTs will be able to image rocky planets uh, even in the habitable zones of other star systems. They will not be used to search for, uh, for these uh, planets. Uh, they will be used for characterize these planets uh, for the most part, uh, both because uh, uh, the, the, this is very time consuming and also because uh, there, are there will be 10 years of searches by the time the telescopes will start operations so that will have detected many of these planets. So it will not, they will not search exoplanet uh, using astrometry or uh, micro lenses or transits. But on the other side, it will be able to make direct imaging in the optical and infrared of planets around other stars, um, and also uh, to, to characterize their atmospheres um, because uh, of the very large collecting power that these telescopes have. There are essentially two methods in which you can uh, detect these planets uh, within ELT. There are others for other uh, facilities. And one is the method of the radial velocities, Radial velocities are the speed at which uh, bodies uh, go around each other, and if you have two bodies of roughly the same mass, they have a center of mass which is uh, in the middle between them. But when you look at uh, stars and planets, the stars are incredibly much heavier, and what happens is that uh, the uh, barycenter of, uh, of the system ends up being inside the star itself, and therefore, therefore the variations uh, in the radial velocities of the stars, uh, which is the reflex motion of the planet going around it, tend to be very small. And uh, if you want to be able to detect uh, Earth-like planets with this method, you have uh, to have uh, accuracies uh, in your velocity um, determinations that are of the order of a few centimeters per second. So you will, we will need very, very stable spectrographs uh, to be able to detect uh, uh, 
uh, Earth-like planets. Uh, so the, the, you see the science cases put uh, the requ strong requirements not only on the telescope itself, on the quality that it, uh, that it can deliver, but also, of course, on the instruments. And uh, here is uh, a plot with uh, uh, the known, at the moment, uh, uh, planets that have been discovered um, with radial velocity methods and uh, uh, the ability of uh, uh, a high resolution spectrograph to go and, and, and test uh, their, uh, their mass is something that uh, has been demonstrated by simulations. Direct imaging is the thing that uh, we still do not have very much about. We have a few uh, uh, planets that have been imaged uh, around other stars, but they tend very, very far from those, uh, parent, their parent stars, and also uh, very heavy uh, compared to the planets in our system. This is one of the most challenging uh, observations uh, for any kind of telescope, be it an 8-meter telescope or, or, or an ELT, because the contrast uh, be on brightness between the star, the parent star and the planet itself is enormous. It's a factor of about uh, a billion to 10 billion when you look uh, at uh, an Earth-like planet. And uh, the selection of the method uh, to suppress uh, the light uh, of the parent star or the wavelengths in which you can make these observations uh, is very critical to the success of this kind of, uh, of uh, observations. And uh, you can see that uh, the, at longer wavelengths uh, towards uh, the far infrared, uh, the, the, the ratio between uh, the parent star and the planet uh, is uh, smaller, and that might make us ho hopeful that uh, uh, this uh, is a great advantage. Of course, it's not a great advantage from the ground, uh, where the uh, background uh, uh, of the observations is very bright and therefore it's very difficult to make observations of something that is a million times uh, fainter than, uh, than a, a, a fairly bright star, but uh, of course uh, that, that is much better exploited uh, in space. On the ground, however, uh, we have to contend to ma with many things and one is uh, atmospheric turbulence. And here is a simulation of what atmospheric turbulence does. Um, sorry. A star, a light from a star is uh, uh, distorted and uh, aberrated by, by the turbulence in the atmosphere and adaptive optics measures these uh, um, aberrations and through a, a deformable mirror that, that can be modified uh, uh, hundreds or thousands times per second is able to reconstruct uh, the original waveform as if or almost as if it was in space, and you can see it can produce uh, images that are at the diffraction limit. Uh, this is uh, key for the ability to detect planets, and uh, the, what is needed uh, is to have extremely high uh, corrections, so what we call the extreme adaptive optics. Adaptive optics works. I always like to show this picture, which is, uh, uh, is not exactly on, on theme here, but this is uh, an image of uh, um, some results uh, with uh, a, a multi-conjugate adaptive optics demonstrator that we um, used uh, on sky at the VLT and shows you what uh, kind of correction you can do even on large fields uh, with adaptive optics. And of course, we all heard uh, the fantastic results from the LBT. And so I think that uh, the uh, doubts one might have about uh, the ability of adaptive optics to produce uh, or to help us uh, finding planets uh, are a, a little bit pushed.